Growing up, my father was in World War II. He was an officer who was a forward observer in uh, Europe and was wounded. He's over at the VA, he's 99, and still some shrap metal in his hand. And so when I was little, he'd say, Frankie, what are you doing? I'd go, we're playing Army, Dad. He'd say, play Navy. <laughs> he said, you always have a clean place to sleep, good food. So, uh, you know, Vietnam really wasn't part of any of my awareness as a kid. It was always something my friends' older brothers were going to or, you know, it had nothing really to do with me until I hit about 17, 18, and then we knew, you know, it was due to do because it was a draft. So one uh, evening at a, I forget what restaurant we were at, there were about five of us, and uh, I said, you know, my dad said we should play Navy, and I figured we were going to get drafted, so we might as well cut our own path. So we enlisted in the Navy. I enlisted in 1963. I uh, was the first of eight kids that stayed home and uh, tried to attempt, attempted to go to the University of Illinois. And back then, because the university was a land-grant college, it required all males to uh, be a member of the military in some form or another. Uh, they dropped that requirement the following year, by the way. So I didn't know anything about the uh, ROTC program, so um, I knew my maternal grandfather was a, a chief, career chief petty officer from 1902 to 21, and never knew him, of course. He died when my mother was only three years old. And uh, <clears throat> because of knowing his history, I, I wanted to join the Navy, so I joined the Naval Reserve. I served, I served in the combat zone in, uh, uh, off, off of Vietnam on both of my cruises. Uh, my first cruise was on the USS Bonham Richard. Um, she was an Essex-class carrier, and my second cruise was on the Ticonderoga, USS Ticonderoga. She was also an Essex-class carrier. They were both veterans of World War II. The Ticonderoga took a kamikaze hit in the Battle of the Philippine Sea, killed 143 men. I enlisted right out of high school. I graduated in 1958 and went right into the service. I enlisted in, uh, in uh, Los Angeles APHIS uh, Center and um, I requested that I get into hospital corps school. Uh, at that time I was in college and I was in a pre-med student um, status and um, so I wanted to do something that was related to medicine and uh, of course I, you know, you hear the stories about hospital corpsmen and the Marine Corps and all the, the tradition and history that they have and I, I really wanted to be part of that so uh, I enlisted in that and of course they sent me to San Diego to go to boot camp and then uh, from there to the hospital corps school which was uh, 16 weeks of intense uh, intense training and uh, then uh, transferred to um, the Naval Hospital where I worked in the intensive care unit for a year learning to uh, work with med and surgical intensive care patients and um, a tremendous experience from there. Born and raised in Danville, Illinois. I served in the U.S. Army. I was a military intelligence specialist. I served in Germany in the Vietnam era just after the Berlin Wall was built. They were building up a large group of U.S. Army personnel in Germany. And our main uh, purpose was to uh, interview border crossers from the East Zone and to provide security uh, for the missile batteries. And at the time, those missile batteries were highly classified, had triple fences around them, guard dogs, armed guards that shot first and then asked questions later. Uh, the ground was burned around between the fences, so nobody could get in there. I had a top secret cosmic clearance, which was the highest clearance that was available, and the main purpose for that was ostensibly those missiles were ground to air to, if the Russians flew over in a bomber. In actual fact, and known only to some of the U.S. military personnel and probably less than a half a dozen of the German uh, officials, those missiles had a ground to ground capability with a nuclear weapon. It, by the time the war started and by the time I left for this assignment over there, I had already been in the service for nine years, okay? I was, mm -hmm. 
by that time professional soldier, so I didn't feel anything other than it was my job. Well, my first job was as an infantryman. Mm -hmm. And when I re-enlisted, I went into the aviation side. So I had a lot of jobs mm -hmm. and different experiences in 23 years. Uh, was tra trained as a plane captain, got qualified within a, a record time, about three months. Uh, I was up on the flight deck uh, and I was in charge of a $27 million piece of equipment in the life of a pilot. Uh, it was a single seat aircraft. Um, that's the F-8 Crusader. That's the aircraft my squadron flew. And uh, <clears throat> it, was a, it was a very rewarding experience. Uh, the closest we got to any real action was, um, oh, it was probably 76 when the uh, soldier was killed, killed in uh, um, South Korea and they activated our unit to um, to go to the next step as far as, you know, when, you, when you're when uh, a mobile unit, something happens, you get activated, and our, our job was to move from Austin, Texas to Shaw Air Force Base, and then from there, there we move on to, you know, if we, if we got called into action to uh, South Korea. But that never happened. It was resolved. Korea, North Korea, the North Koreans, we would go to general quarters two times a day, sometimes three times a day, because they would send Ru they were Russian planes. They were called badgers and bears, Russian bears. They were big bombers. And they would send them out just to kind of harass us a little bit. So uh, I think they're still doing it today, aren't they? Most of the work I did was individual. Uh, Again, they were sending military personnel who were also, uh, many of them, they all required a security clearance because of what they were dealing with. Many of them were shipped over there before they had a chance to do an adequate background check of their security. And I also had special identification as an uh, intelligence specialist. So no one there except a few people in my office really knew what my rank was. Even my medical records were sanitized, so there was no evidence in them as to who I really was. I had some informants, uh, German citizens, that we paid to, to uh, inform us about anything that went on. For instance, uh, I was there when Kennedy was assassinated, and one of our informants uh, reported that they heard a snatch of a conversation on a radio channel. We were never able to finish pinning it down, but uh, Die Amisa hast ein Holzbein, which means the ant has a wooden leg. And that obviously was a code for something. But, I mean, this, this happened within a few hours after Kennedy was assassinated, but we were never able to determine that. What, what that was about. Yeah. Um. As we were flying out, I don't know how long it took from the Philippines to get out to, to where the ship was. It seemed like forever. And I remember one of the petty officers said, if you guys want to see your ship before we land, you can look out this portal here. Oh, cool. You know, so I hooked it. I thought I was going to see this thing. And honest to God, if you would take a paper match and bite the head off the paper match and just have that little skinny strip and throw it down on the carpet, that's what I was looking at. And I th said, we're going to land on this thing? You know, are you kidding me? I found out years later that Lloyd's of London, the insurance company, the big insurance company, considers the flight deck of an aircraft carrier the most dangerous man-made work environment there is. Uh, statistically, they consider it almost as, as dangerous as a battlefield. Um, on my second cruise, the first day in a war zone, I literally came within one step of walking into a turning prop. Uh, that was my closest call during my total of uh, probably about 18 months at sea. Um, the other incident I had was my aircraft was up on the catapult. They folded the outer wing panel down. It didn't look like it locked. I was checking it out. I had my hand 
in the space where the aileron is at, somebody on the other side of the aircraft gave the pilot signal to take the stick and do that, which made the ailerons go up and down. And it's like a 3,000 pound hydraulic shear. Um, I ended up with a blood blister on that finger, cracked this finger, and ended up with about 30 stitches in those two fingers. But it didn't lose my fingertips, fortunately. Uh, we had uh, one brother-in-law that uh, he was shot in Nam, but he was one of the lucky ones to return. But we had mixed feelings because uh, we had two, my brother-in-law and a cousin that served over there. And uh, luckily, you know, both of them come back. You know, the war when I was there was spread all over. And they would hit one base or they'd hit another base. And I don't know if I was lucky. I was never aware that it hit. My brother-in-law, he had uh, um, problems mentally because of what happened to him over there. Um, the, the best we could tell, um, it took him 20 years to even acknowledge that he went to Vietnam because he had to, he had to kill people. And he was, uh, you know, bitter. He, he, uh, he was shot by a sniper, and the first thing that he said is, you know, they, they got the guy. They got the sniper. But, uh, you know, he, when he was over there, he, he got a, a Purple Heart pinned on by General Westmoreland. <coughs> And he really, coming home, he wasn't proud of it because uh, the American people didn't recognize it. If you understand or if you've heard what happened back in those 60s, um, it was not a pleasant time for uh, military. Um, the public had a very dim view. In fact, we were called everything from baby killer to warmongers to whatever. Uh, and so we took a lot of heat. And uh, so most of uh, the... Uh, people who were in the military time, when they went off base, never went off in a uniform. They went off in civvies and pretty much always wore a ball cap to cover the white wall haircut that we always had to have. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was a very difficult time for especially young people. I was very lucky when I went in, I was almost 21, but I ran into a lot of the kids that were there. They were 17 years old who had never been away from home before. And so this experience for them to to be going to fight for their country and to be treated that way by their own people uh, was very hard for some of them to accept. It really was. And uh, so a lot of them um, um, didn't go off base. They just stayed on the base. You know, we were there, and I think to a large degree what my experience was, we, uh, we helped a lot of people over there. You know, if somebody was hurt, we met about as many Vietnamese civilians as we did, you know, wounded mm -hmm. Marines, okay? If a kid got hurt or happened all the time, we treated them, met them, mm -hmm. and fixed them up. So, you know, military people aren't boogeymen, they're not supermen, you know, they, the discipline there isn't any worse than it should be any place. I mean, mm -hmm. I never thought my civil rights were violated mm -hmm. because I wore a uniform, but, you know. Well, I think, I think they have a place and they have the right to voice their opinion, but when it comes to, uh, you know, violence and stuff like that, it's, I think it's wrong. Um, we, when I was in, I run into several people that I worked for and worked with that they thought it was wrong and there's no way that they would, you know, carry a gun. But the position that we were in, um, we didn't, you know, we weren't, we weren't going to carry a gun anyway because um, all our jobs were behind the, the lines on uh, Air Force bases, you know, flying, and, and uh, unless you were in the heat of battle, uh, you know, in Nam, uh, some of the 
Air Force personnel, they did have to carry guns, but, um, you know, that wasn't our primary goal. You know, our goal was to keep the planes flying. The physical, probably not, because I was probably in, in the most fit I ever was in my life when I was with the Marine Corps. I mean, I look back and I looked at my discharge papers and uh, to see what I was, I was lean and mean. When I, when I was discharged from there, I was 6'2 and 175 pounds. There was no fat on me at all. I mean, I was really lean, very, very fit because of the fact that in those days, in the 60s, John F. Kennedy had started um, what he called his physical fitness, a 50-50, and where you swim 50 miles or run 50 miles, but the Marine Corps picked that up as part of their training program. So we were out there doing push-ups and doing all the things that he would try to do, and, and it worked very well because the Marine Corps, that's the name of their game, is physically fit. The worst part was the mental. Um, when I was, and not so much at Camp Pendleton as it was at San Diego Naval Hospital, because there we took medevacs back from Vietnam. And when we bring 17-year-old kids who, like I said, never been away from home. I'm sorry. They come back and they're on circoelectric beds, never to walk again at 17. That's where I was affected the most, having to take care of these kids and send them home to their mom and dad, and knowing they're going to be fed with a tube and never walk or talk again. Uh, that's the hard part of the war that uh, you don't ever forget. You don't ever forget that. Uh, the physical part of it, one thing, but the mental really does take its toll on you. So, yeah, there's there's parts that, to this day, that, um, uh, I hardly even talk to my wife about because she knows it uh, breaks me down. So. Well, number one, I get really upset every time I hear somebody say we lost the Vietnam War. We did not lose the Vietnam War. We did not sign a treaty. We did not sign a surrender document. We never lost a battle in Vietnam. We, we maybe lost some small skirmishes, but we never lost a major battle in Vietnam. Well, I, I don't think a lot of people understood the war and what we were doing over there. And I think to the point we, we got so involved that we couldn't back out because we committed ourselves so deeply into helping that, uh, you know, there's nothing we could do. Even to this day, the Vietnam era vet is still not fully respected. I see, uh, we, we, we're doing better. We're doing better with the Afghan uh, veterans coming back, Iran, all those vets that are coming back. I really do appreciate when I see um, people, civilians, going to the airports and, and welcoming these kids back from their duty and, and applauding them for, for doing their duty and, and being obedient to the, you know, their command. Um, I visit the VA hospital here and I talk to uh, the vets here and a lot of them still do not feel they've ever been accepted back and, or, or that their service was ever accepted uh, by the people. So I want the people to know those people in Vietnam era they gave their all. They gave everything they had to, to do what they thought was right. And that's the bottom line. It wasn't like they were trying to win any political points or some elected office. They were doing their duty and doing the best they can. And they did. They gave everything they could. And, and I think under the circumstances and under the policies that they had uh, to work under, they did a remarkable job. Because they were like fighting a war with one hand behind their back. They did not have the freedom of a true military leader telling them what to do. They had black suits and white shirts and ties telling them what to do. And, and it's unfortunately people who have never done any military service. Who, so they're trying to run the military and have no idea how it operates. And that's, that would be my thing is that we still make an effort 
for these Vietnam vets. We're losing more of them. We, I see them out here at the hospital, and we're losing more of them as they go, and, and, they're, and they're slipping away, never knowing how they uh, are being appreciated for what they did. So, yeah, that'd be my wish right there. I think professional military people are probably romantics at heart. Uh, you know, you, you go, okay, I'm here, I'm doing this so somebody's family can sleep. Um, it's a shame we ever have to do that. It's a shame we ever have to send any of our, you know, loved ones, whether you're children or brothers or sisters or aunts or uncles or anybody, to do it. But I think, um, as you're aware, at your age, in today's kind of living, uh, freedom isn't free. And if we uh, want to maintain the freedoms that we have, like right now, to be able just to talk to you about this and share my thoughts on communism and South Vietnam, to be able to do that, it, uh, it costs treasure.